Welcome to another episode of I Just Interview My Friends. I'm Jason Chow, and today I'm interviewing my friend, Sela Victor. Uh, she, we first met when she was production manager uh, at yeah. Actors Co-op, which is an amazing theater uh, company in Hollywood. Um, and then you may know her as Chloe Bourgeois, especially if you have kids my age, <laughs> uh, from The Miraculous Ladybug. Um, and I, my favorite, of course, is that she plays Jennifer Jean, the lead character in my first serialized fiction podcast, Omega Man, which if you have not checked out, is at omegamanpodcast.com. It might be dead, which we'll talk about. Hopefully we can do more with it. But um, but yeah, if I, I had a great time and everyone I know that has listened to it uh, has said they really enjoyed it. So, um, Sela, um how did you get the acting bug? When did this start? Oh gosh, great question to start off with. Um, so funny story. I was actually a very, very shy child. Like um, you would never, never believe it today. But I was very shy and my grandmother was like, oh, but I liked to sing and you know perform for my family at home. And my grandmother, when, my, when she heard that I was in school, I was you know not raising my hand or not, reading out loud because I was too shy and all this she said to my mom you got to get her into drama into theater mm. and classes and I'll pay for it because I'm one of eight kids so my parents couldn't really afford things like that you know so she paid for me to go to the melodrama summer camp in Bakersfield <laughs> Mel melodrama, melodrama. We had not this just drama. Mel not just melodrama. drama. Melodrama explains a lot <laughs> um, and it's it, it was this awesome theater I don't know, but I think it still exists in Bakersfield. It was a dinner theater, a melodrama dinner theater. And they had this summer camp for kids. And I just came out of my shell. Just And how old were you at the time? I was 10 years old, fifth wow. grade. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you were shy all up until then. Oh, yeah. I would not talk to people <laughs> at all. I was very, I went to three kindergarten, we moved a lot, kindergartens. Mm -hmm. And I think that was part of it, maybe just feeling, you know, it's hard to adjust like that as a kid. And, and uh, yeah, so that really got me out of my shell. And then as luck would have it, oh, wait, oh my gosh, maybe that was actually third grade. Yes, that was third grade because then um, they built this new school. And as luck would have it, my street was like on the boundary where for fourth grade, I had to go to this new school. And this new school was a performing arts magnet school. Wow. So all of a sudden, after taking this camp, I had access to all these free classes that normally, yeah, my parents couldn't afford, but I could take after school dance, singing, theater, all for free. And that just, I mean, it really gave me, you know, the bug and everything. Mm -hmm. And I was in all the school plays. Uh -huh. And what's, everything. what was like, what was like your, like your favorite moment that you can remember from that? Early well, time? okay. So <laughs> the other funny story. So, okay, so like probably third grade or whatever, I do the melodrama. Then fourth grade, the first play that I can audition for at this school is The Wizard of Oz, which was my absolute favorite, like growing up, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm so excited and I go in. Well, I'm still new at auditioning. I'm still new. I'm not like misconfident yet. And I freak out and I have like probably a terrible audition, but they could tell that I really wanted to be involved, you know. Mm -hmm. So they felt sorry for me. So they made me classic the, move. Yeah, classic <laughs> school. Like we could tell she really wants to do this, but she just can't. And so they made me the page turner for the music for the pian pianist uh -huh. to turn the pages as he played. And I was like so excited. I thought this was a role in the play. You know, I was the page turner. <laughs> and so I'm turning the pages to the music. I dress up in this big white dress and I'm very proud and telling everyone I'm the page turner. You know, this is my role. And all of a sudden people thought, people I didn't know thought my name was Paige Turner. <laughs> they thought I would, so people were calling me Paige like in school because it was a new school. Nobody, no, you know. It's, it's not a bad screen name if you think about it. <laughs> Paige Turner. Yeah. I know. I was so, I was like, and I was so shy that I didn't correct people. <laughs> oh, no. Common pattern. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So it when, was. When do you feel like that kind of changed in you where you were like, okay, now I can speak up and was drama a part of that, that, that change? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like it probably happened. Well, so I, I would say even to this day, believe it or not, like auditioning 
still is not my <laughs> strong suit. It's so scary for me. I, I don't know if it's anybody's. <laughs> I mean, I know it's terrible, especially if you are really deep down a shy type of person and mm -hmm. you've just learned how to mask it. Like you go into an audition room, you don't know these people, most likely the casting directors. It's very uncomfortable. It's awkward. You know, it's so even to this day, inside starts shaking or whatever. That's why actually I was so grateful for COVID and virtual auditions now mm. because I can do them at my house and I don't have the nerves and, mm. you know, the anxiety. So. And you can redo them easily. <laughs> exactly. You can do 500 takes, whatever, yeah. you know. So, yeah, definitely. But anyway, I feel like in sixth grade, I auditioned for my first professional play musical, Annie. Mm -hmm. And I got in. I was one of the orphans. And I was actually Annie's understudy, too. And that was like a huge just confidence boost. I felt mm. like I got this. Like, I know I'm good, you know. Mm. So I think that was really it. And then from then on, I was like, I think I was 13. I made this chart that was like, okay, how am I going to get to Broadway? And it was like each year what I needed to do to get to Broadway after, I think I put it for after college. Why was, um, why was Broadway the goal? I think because I just knew musical theater mm -hmm. and it wasn't until college that I went to UC Irvine, which was, you know, an hour from LA that I realized, oh, I could actually do TV and film and, and I don't, mm -hmm. I don't need to, cause what happened basically was, um, not to jump ahead a few years, uh -huh. but my senior year of college, I got called back on Broadway for, for the musical Gypsy to be a Louise standby and for, I don't remember the other role, but anyway, it, so I flew to New York. It was in the middle of December, my first trip to New York. Wow. And I'm a California girl. It was snowing and cold and the apartment I was staying at was small and dingy. And I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> I do not want this lifestyle. Uh -huh. And then I, so that was my senior year of college. I kind of had to figure it out, you know, and yeah. I was like, well, I still love acting and I bet you I can do some theater in LA. And why don't I look into TV and film because you can make a lot more money. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that was important to me too. You know, growing up with no money, I was like, I don't want to be poor anymore. <laughs> I don't want to live in a dingy apartment in New York and make no money. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, and pay it all on rent. Yeah. So, so when, but kind of going back a little bit to like that yeah. junior high to high school age, was there a moment where you really like fell in love with it? Because you knew you were good at it, right? You knew it was yeah. like, oh, this is something I could do. Was there a role or a performance where you're like, ooh, this feels right? Yeah. I mean... I would have to say even back into in those elementary school plays, because that school that I went to Thorner Elementary in Bakersfield was amazing. Like we were number one in everything, whether it was I was a cheerleader to like the competitions, but the shows were so our musicals were amazing. Like they were I don't even know how else to describe it. They were just professional. It was awesome. And so I felt like when by the time I was in sixth grade and got that professional show, I just loved it. The school really gave me that passion and love for it. And then doing that, that Annie show, I loved that. And I think just going into junior high, I kept doing professional shows at the Civic Light Opera, the Bakersfield Civic Light Opera. And I just loved it more and more. High school, same thing. And actually in high school too, I started driving as soon as I got my license. My parents were so cool because I wouldn't let my teenager do this, but they let me drive to LA and go on auditions. Wow. I know. I know. So I auditioned for a few TV and film things. I had no clue what I was doing. You know, I had a little agent who had zero pull, pull in the industry. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't book anything, but. <laughs> what do you think it was about acting? Like, because I've, I've heard from diff many different actors, right? And there's different things about acting that they love. What was it that you really kind of, what part of acting did you really fall in love with? That's a good question. I think first it was singing, to be totally honest. Like, I just love, and I still love singing. And so it was that musical theater type of performing that I really fell in love with. But then when, so I think it was, gosh, when did I do... I was in a show probably my freshman year of high school. I don't even remember what it was called. It was like this new play in Bakersfield. And I was the comedy, I was the character that was funny. And I loved, I realized in that moment, like I love making people laugh and I was good at it too. Mm. Cause I think sometimes 
your you know, comic timing is just something you're born with. And for whatever reason, that was, I, I realized I'm like, oh, I'm good at this. Like, this is fun. Mm -hmm. And I loved the feeling of making people laugh. And also being that shy kid and having that anxiety, I think anytime I was playing somebody else, it went away. It was like when I had to, I, it, to this day, when I have to like host something as myself, I'm like, bleh, 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 my mouth gets all, you know, uh -huh. but when I can be a character, it's mm. so much better. You know, I, don't, I, I can hide behind them a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. That, like, embodiment aspect. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're in high school and then you, as you mentioned, you went to UC Irvine. Mm -hmm. Why UC Irvine? What was the process in trying to pick where to go? So, okay. So I don't mean this against UC Irvine in any way because I, I had a great experience, but I wish to this day <laughs> that I went to LA. I wish I went to UCLA because of what I'm doing now. I wish I had, what happened was and this is what made the decision for Irvine is I got into UCLA into the school, but I didn't get into the theater program because oh. I auditioned for the musical theater program. And that was, and by the way, it was the very first year of that program. And really? there were only six female slots. I don't know if it's like that anymore. Hopefully. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I know I was like, what? It was this crazy. I didn't get in obviously, mm -hmm. but I got into the school and not really knowing you know, I wish someone had advised me, but no, who would advise me? I knew nobody in LA for the industry or anything. And I wish someone had said though, just move to LA, get to know the industry. Cause this town is the industry. Yeah. So unfortunately I was removed and I was so focused on theater until that senior year of college that I didn't really get the knowledge and the taste that I spent the first three or four or five years learning in LA. And by then, they say, you know, your the golden years are really like eighteen. <laughs> like, <laughs> Nowadays, it's it seems like twelve. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no, it's true. You know, so by the time I kind of figured out the industry, I was like mm -hmm. twenty seven years old. And I got my finally got on TV. You know, mm -hmm. so but it took me that long, and I wish I would have just moved here when I was eighteen and figured it out. But mm -hmm. God has a reason, and yeah. who knows what yeah. I would have been. <laughs> and you know, like, I think figuring out like the business element, right, is always yes. there. But you and I, we've talked a lot about very talented, good looking people that, that, then, that then try to be actors, right? With, yeah. But they can't yeah. act, right? They can't act. You know, they can talk and they can walk, right? But yeah. they can't do it at the but same time. Can. That's right? right. Like, that's right. In that there time, what do you think? What do you think helped you to become a better actor, right? Like what were your influences that right. really helped you grow? Well, and I will say, going back to the college thing, I am glad, even though I know it sounds like I regret my UCI decision, <laughs> it's not that. It's um, UCI, and actually the reason I chose UCI is because they have one of the best theater programs in the whole United States. Their grad program, I think, is like number three or something. So that's why I chose it. The professors were amazing. And I got a full ride scholarship and I was like in the honors program. So there was all these things and I was still close to my parents in California. Mm -hmm. I got into East Coast schools and I just, I didn't feel like doing that. Anyway, sorry, not to- No, I 100% understand. <laughs> I wrote off right? all the East Coast schools too. <laughs> Me too, I was like, I don't wanna live over there. And I got into like Harvard and a couple of those that didn't even have theater really programs, you know? And anyway, I didn't, I. I also wasn't as knowledgeable about like my husband was very much guided into what choice he should make. My parents were like, UCI is free. Go there. You know? <laughs> so, it is true. Not having true. debt does help the life of an actor. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. And, and uh -huh. being one of eight kids, you know, they're like, that's a good one. Go there. <laughs> so, and it was, and that is, I will say when I went to UC Irvine, I, when I started there, I was like, it's a podcast, so they're not going to see me do this, but like jazz hands and big, you know, over the top face expressions, acting with my eyebrows, you know, mm -hmm. and UCI really helped me uh, as far as technique and grounding. And the, like I said, the professors were amazing. And just the background alone in, in learning every aspect of theater history and studying all the greats, Stanislavski, Shakespeare, you know, all of them, Chekhov, reading um, 
all the plays that were possibly <laughs> ever mm-hmm. written. I'm just kidding. But like uh, <laughs> doing all that, ever every single play ever written, I read. <laughs> no. But I read so many plays and learned theater history. And then I was a part of this improv troupe, which really, actually that improv troupe um, grew into something else very successful and all this stuff. So that was my background for comedy and what I do today. And so that was a huge benefit to get that experience. Mm -hmm. And the musical theater program there was great. In fact, there's so many Broadway stars that have come from UC Irvine. It's crazy, dozens. It's such a great musical theater program. Which, you know, I'd love to hear from you, you know, because I think there's a lot of people that have this misconception about acting, right? Which is hit your mark and say your lines, which is important, (laughs) right? Which is important, right? But they're like, you know, pretty face, right? Like just be an actor, but you know, you have been around, you know, so many different actors. What is it that, you know, an aspiring pretty face, right? Is, is missing, right? What What don't they get about that need for real training? Yeah, that's the thing. It's so funny because even being a trained actor, I get sucked in when I meet like at a workshop or something, at a casting workshop, a young actor who's gorgeous. And I'm like, oh, they're going to be amazing, you know? And then they do their scene and I'm like, oh, they're not amazing. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's such, it's not a skill that is, learned you have to have so much experience and the 10,000 hours and the background it just comes to now to me it comes second nature because I've done it my whole life but even I I you know I every scene I approach with an analytical eye and and use the techniques that I was taught at UC Irvine and other places but actually more at UC Irvine actually um Robert Cohen has this book that I still open and go to to analyze scenes and characters. And and I think that sort of technique and background really helps you. I think being on stage is the ultimate mm-hmm. test. And it's very interesting. I've seen a lot of TV and film actors go to the stage, but they didn't have the stage background before. And it, they're they're terrible. Like, I mean, yeah. not saying I'm like so great or whatever. No, I'm still learning too all the time, but it's very interesting. Now, on the other hand, I've seen theater actors go to film and TV and be fantastic. Yeah. And a, a lot of like aspiring actors that ever, ever I talk to and I'm, they're like, you know, what should I do? And I'm always like, go theater. out for theater, right? Because at least exactly. you're actually acting, right? You're yeah. not just auditioning or modeling. Like you're That's actually right. acting and embodying a character. Well, and um, the audience doesn't lie and the theater doesn't, you can't go back and redo it. You know, like yes. there's no starting over. And, and if you make someone cry, that's real, you yeah, know, it's yeah. not or edited. If air, or if the air conditioning breaks in the middle of a performance. Oh, <laughs> like, it's happened a million times to me. Yes. Exactly. Or they're laughing, you know, that's real. So then when you go on camera, you're like, well, this works because I've done it before. You know, yeah. like, yeah. I don't know. It's the, it's the boot camp for actors. Yeah. All right, so you you turn down Broadway, right? I you, turned no. <laughs> <laughs> right, you chose a different route from I Broadway. Different. I also right? didn't get cast. Like I was thinking about that as I told that uh, story. Like, well, if, I guess if I would have gotten it, I would have been like, well, I guess I'm a New York girl now, you true. know. But it was kind of divine that I did not get cast. Yeah, <laughs> but I do think it's like a lot of times, you know, that decision about a lifestyle as well, right? That's Not right. just what is the work that you want, but what is the lifestyle around the work that you That's want? Right. Because yeah. I, I've seen it, you know, I'm sure you've seen it way more, right? Actors who have the, who, they've got the stuff, right? But they don't want to do it. Like they don't want to do the auditions. They don't want to yeah. do the, they, like, I'd rather just be an accountant, do theater in my free time because I love yeah. it, right? And that's a great life, you know? Yeah. Um, but so for I you then, that. you know, deciding to stay in LA after college, what were those first years like? So uh, when I moved to LA, I had this, first of all, it was like apparent right away that I made the right decision. I had this amazing apartment that like looked like the set of friends, you know, (laughs) for nothing. Like I Uh totally left that with my two best friends who are also actors. You know, we lived like this amazing first in LA life. And I immediately thought, I worked at this restaurant and all all the hostesses and waitresses were actors. And I'm like, Psh, they ain't got nothing on me. I was so confident. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm going to be on a series in a year. They'll see, you know, <laughs> like, uh-huh. that's how confident I was. And then nothing, 
like <laughs> nothing. I couldn't get an agent. I couldn't get my SAG card. I could not. I did. Well, that's not true. I booked one commercial right away and I booked the Jimmy Kimmel show right away. That was all in the first month. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what gave me confidence. I probably thought, oh, I booked these so easily. No problem. Yeah, Hollywood, here I come, you know. But it was a, it was very much a shock when I couldn't even get an agent for years. And I'm talking years. So I just was like, I don't get it. Like, what am I doing wrong? And probably, so that was 22 to probably 26, maybe even maybe 25. I was on the phone with my dad and just as a typical, you know, quarter life crisis, crying and crying and like, I can't do this anymore. I'm working 500 jobs and barely making ends meet. I'm not getting any auditions, you know? And my dad was like, well, what are you doing for marketing? And I'm like, marketing, what are you talking about? What do you know? You know? He <laughs> and was the Instagram guru before they had them. <laughs> totally. He really was. He's uh -huh. like, what do you do? And there, yeah, there was no social media back then. So that's how old I am. Um, but he was like, yeah, what are you, how are you marketing yourself? How are you, who are the people that cast you? And I said, casting directors. He's like, well, how are you meeting these casting directors? And I'm like, you can't meet casting directors. He's like, well, there's got to be a way. And, and then he said, you know, I spent, he runs a Bible college in Bakersfield. And he told me, I don't remember how much he told me he spent per week marketing the Bible college. And he said, you need to spend that or as much as you can mm. make a budget and spend it on marketing. And then I realized, well, there is a way to meet casting directors and that is casting director workshops. So when I was about 25, 26, I started spending, I, I think I budgeted $200 a month to spend to take these workshops mm. to meet casting directors and to market myself. And as soon as I started doing that, I started getting auditions nonstop wow. because they need to meet you in person. They're, it's one thing to get your thumbnail and they weren't even getting that because I didn't have a good agent, you know? Yeah. But once they met me and saw my work, then I started getting auditions and I started my first, I booked The Office right away, which was my favorite show. So mm. I was super stoked. <laughs> and then I started booking right after, as soon as that, you know. And in a way, it's funny too, talking about the age thing. I do think I needed to, I think part of the reason I wasn't getting any traction until my late twenties was I never looked like, like even in my early twenties, I looked like the mom, mm -hmm. like I wasn't the teeny bopper, you know, uh -huh. oh, the girl from the OC on the OC or whatever that I could not ever do that work with those type or be that type. I mean, yeah. so I think I needed to grow into my type and I've been playing thirties since my early or mid twenties. <laughs> yeah. So. Which I mean, I would, I would love to ask you about that, but I, I do want to share that the first time my wife and I saw you at the class, I yeah. can't remember what show it was. Is it remember. Drood? No. Yeah. What, what? So the first show we ever saw was the the Sherlock Holmes show, Hound of oh, the Baskervilles. Okay. And then you were in one the season Let me after. Tenor? Let me a tenor. Drood. Wait, what was it in? Not Let Me a Tenor? It might have been like a, one of those one, the Saturday shows, like the one-time shows. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can't remember. But I remember turning to my wife who I'd watched it with and being like, Oh, she reminds me of Amy Adams because Amy <gasps> Adams had a very no. similar story because she never really looked, you know, that teeny type, right? Yes. And then I know even when she got enchanted, there was a lot of pushback because they were like, she doesn't look young enough. She doesn't look young enough, right? And right. the director was like, I'm not trying to make her look young. She's going to fall in love with Patrick Dempsey. I don't need an 18 year old. Yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, like that would be totally. weird, <laughs> you know? That is um, so funny because I get compared to her all the time still. Yeah, and I think uh, there's a lot of that same quality. You yeah, know. You're right. But for you, I mean, was that a hard thing to do to really like accept this is, this is the way I look. This is the way people perceive me. This is my type. Yes, that was. It was really hard. I felt like first of all, I was always described as womanly because of my figure. <laughs> I know. Like, <laughs> I'm like, great. What does that what mean? That? <laughs> I'm fat. Uh -huh. You know, so there was the Hollywood, like, I feel like I'm too fat complex. And like, I look back at pictures of myself at 22. I'm like, I wish I had that body again. <laughs> don't don't <laughs> we know? all. Don't we all. Give me that body. Yeah. But, but yeah. And then I was, because I was womanly, I was either called in for, and I played, You, I mean, you could see my IMDb, a lot of prostitutes, a lot of strippers, you know, <laughs> I was so curvy. And, uh -huh. and so I, I felt very like, this is just 
not what I wanted to do in mm. on TV. You know, <laughs> of course, you're grateful for the work, and a lot of it was comedy, which I love co- of doing. You know, that's my main thing. So I, I never thought like I never was like embarrassed per se, but I just was like, why am I only getting these roles because of my yeah. body? You know, mm-hmm. and um, so that was frustrating. And I think it was frustrating when I was in my early 20s, knowing that I was good as good or or better than these other girls Mm -hmm. and i just couldn't because of my look or whatever but also looking back i was totally not good at marketing my dad was right like i didn't know about branding i didn't know about my headshots were all wrong for what i should have been branding myself as now that i look back so if i would have known a lot of these 20 year olds 22 year olds now coming out of college They've had so much education in this, in marketing. It's their lives, yeah. It's their lives, whether it's through social media or even their, even, there's classes now at schools about yeah. this. Yeah, I see, like, I see, like, high school kids, like, the photos they posted themselves, and I'm like, That's right. you, try to, you try to be a model, an actor? And they're like, no, this is just, me. this is what we do now, right? Like, What they do, they curate their image, yeah. you know? And I wish someone had said that for acting, like, I actually did have an actor friend tell me probably in my early 20s that my headshots were wrong. And I was like, what are you talking about? These are great, you know. Because you look beautiful in them. Yeah, I thought I looked great. Exactly. But he was trying to say, and I totally understood now, understand now what he was trying to say because he was older and very established as an actor. And But yeah, I didn't understand then. So I think that was part of it. Yeah, as as a director, right, like I've, run into that so many times where you get their headshots and they look a certain way and then they come in you're like yeah they're like but then but then i'm like if your headshot was this i bet you would be get called into roles where you are perfect right right. but because your headshot is trying to look like brad pitt (laughs) right like and you're not brad pitt so true it's so true and the art of the headshot alone i mean my friends tease me because I've taken, I think I've taken more headshots than any actor. Because <laughs> <laughs> I also have this tendency to photograph very differently than uh-huh. what, like whether it's my face expression, I don't know what I do, but it's so hard to get those pictures for me. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Which is also another reason why I love the co-op because now every time I write something or every time I like, I'm just like, who in the co-op, <laughs> who in totally. the co-op am I seeing, right? Because I've seen them do so many different roles. I'm just like, I'll just write it for you know Townsend, right? Because yes, you can totally like play acting. this. My husband does that too when he writes. He yeah. like, yeah, he's like, who in the yeah. co-op? It's like a casting, casting yeah. area. So in that time, right? You're you're getting, you know, you're struggling. You're starting to get stuff. What keeps you going artistically what makes you still kind of love being an actor okay so that's another great question so when i first moved to la i actually joined the co-op my Mm. senior year of college with my best friend dana who was an intern there so that's how we heard about it because she was interning and she was like hey let's audition for this christian theater company you know and and this will be great for us to have a community when we move to la and i'm like okay so we both get in it's great I'm loving it. And then um, flash forward to having 5 million jobs and now I have a boyfriend and all this stuff. So I'm like, I can't do this theater anymore because it, it is, it's a time commitment. It, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't pay. Your nights and weekends are caught up all the time. And I was working in the restaurant, so that wasn't gonna work. So um, I went on leave. I think I was from probably two or three years I was on leave. And then when I had that conversation with my dad, that was the other thing he told me. He Mm. said, you need to get back into the theater company because Mm. your muscles are weak. You're not, Mm. you know, you're not working it out. I'm I'm like, how did he know all this? (laughs) He was right about everything. (laughs) And he's not an actor or anything, Uh you know, or in the industry, but he, well, he sings, but anyway, he's not like in the industry. And so, but he knew, and he's like, you gotta get back in the theater. You gotta do plays. And he's like, and that's how people will see you do your your work. And he was so right. It was the perfect answer. I that's so that's how I kept my creative. Now I also did Second City, um, oh, LA. Uh, yeah, and yes, and I found um, some par- writing partners, and we filmed a bunch of sketches. And this is like right when YouTube was starting, so we put them up on YouTube. 
none of them made us famous, but. Um, Otherwise but was, you wouldn't be talking to me for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd still talk to you. No, but I was like, you know, one of the early sketch, you can go back and they're kind of, it's kind of hilarious because they're so vintage now, you uh-huh. know? <laughs> like standard deaf, like. Totally, it's so funny. Like uh-huh. the cuts are all like on the iMovie probably. I don't even know what we were using. But it was great to keep, like you said, to keep your creative juices flowing and and do all that. Yeah, so. and you know, being I, I had found Actors Co-op. Actually, no, yeah, I found Actors Co-op six, five, six years ago, I think now. Okay. Um, it's been a while, but at the time, I was surprised, right, that there was a Christian community doing art so yeah. well <laughs> right and, and not right and not just well. like well for christians i mean like like beyond what i had seen at other yeah. small theaters right yeah um but one of the questions i definitely had for you is the church in general is not very well built for artists right to yeah. support artists what yeah. was some of your struggles kind of you know with your church community growing up right yeah. or in your church community as you were working where you were like yeah, what was that like? Gosh, Jason, you have great questions. That is something I have thought about a lot, a lot because it took probably, I don't know, maybe even until recently to even be open to do certain roles and certain things. And still there's things I won't do, but um, that was one of the reasons I even wanted to join the club because I wouldn't even say a cuss word on Mm -hmm. stage or whatever when, or maybe like I would say it on stage, but I would feel very bad about it, (laughs) you know? And it was something that I couldn't embrace because of feeling like all growing up, it, you know, it's almost like you're a sinner if you do that, even if you're acting. And I remember being in high school and hearing this talk in church about like, or in like, I think it was like my church drama club about like, if you're acting and you act this character, that means you really have that inside somewhere or something. It was like this weird thing. Uh-huh. So I'd always feel guilty and like, I didn't want to mm-hmm. displease God. And and I think finally finding the co-op and finding artists who want to tell stories and not just stories to be, there's a difference between telling a story for, to you know send a message or, or right, like make a, a point. Yeah. yeah. And, and but but there's also a difference between doing something vulgar for the sake of vulgarity, which I think a lot of people do that too. So I think it was finding that balance where I was really wanting to inhabit a character and be truthful to the character and feel okay with that and be vulnerable with that. And that is, I think for Christians, that's really hard to find that and not not feel. I when I was actually okay, so maybe I did feel it before. Um, when I was in England, I went to England my junior year of college to study mm-hmm. abroad, and I played Sally Bowles in Cabaret, mm-hmm. and that was my first, like, yeah, I know. Like and, Bustier and, and like. Yes, yeah, <laughs> all the whole shebang. She's having sex, she's smoking, she's, you know, I never even smoked a cigarette in real life, and like, I remember them trying to teach me how to smoke one, and I was like, wow. And it was so hard for me to get mm-hmm. there, and the director, who's a really good friend of mine really had to work hard to get me there because I could sing the role better than anyone but right. acting wise yeah he had his work cut out for him and it was it was something like I think was really good for me though too to kind of get me out of that I had to I had to be vulnerable and open and and, and that's so important as an actor you can't censor yourself you can't mm-hmm. censor the character this is a person you know and that's tricky as a Christian. Yeah. But I think that that reverse side, you know, is something that often the church is missing, right? Like yeah. that abil- that willingness to be vulnerable, that willingness yeah. to ask, why is this character behaving the way they are instead of just condemning them? Right? Yes. Um, yes. You know, in what ways then, you know, did you find like your work in the co-op or your work as an actor right? How did that kind of maybe expand your view of God or your understanding of your faith? Yeah. I think it's funny. I think um, until you go through those kind of character, like walk in their shoes and have empathy and for, for somebody, right. And, And when you're inhabiting a character, 
And until you yourself go through things in your life and not saying you have to like go down a terrible path in order to play these characters. But I think the older I got and the more mistakes I made, you know, and things that I wasn't proud of or whatever. um, I think I understood God more. I think you, it's very hard to understand grace if you've never been on the other side, you know, Yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I think that, um, I mean, not saying like, I don't know, I, I, without going into like (laughs) details, but I think certain parts of my life made me realize that grace is, is God, God is grace. And, and I think if we, if we believe in Jesus and what he offers, then we believe in grace. And that is the same with characters that if you are really going to believe that Jesus offers this forgiveness of sins and everything, then you have, you can't judge the character, you know, Mm. as you're trying to, so wait, what was the question? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever you said was amazing. So whatever my question was okay. must have been amazing too. Your um, question was amazing. <laughs> yeah, about, but I, like, I, I feel that, you know, especially, you know, it's funny because I think I used to feel it a lot in movies. And I got as I got kind of more discerning with film, I feel it less because <laughs> a lot of the movies I watch now are bad. Like there's things I pick apart, right? Right. But yeah. then with theater, you know, one of the things that I love as a theater member, right, as an audience member, right, um, is feeling that. Like I remember walking out of Our Town or what was the one about the woman who came home and like she was kind of like washed up and then she like falls in the, what was it? Oh, um, Summer and Smoke? Summer and Smoke, yeah. right? And I remember because that was one of the, That was one where I had brought, I think I had brought somebody from our church. And then during the intermission, they were like, this isn't about God. And I was like, and I was like, I don't know what show, I don't know what show you're watching, right? And then when we reached the end and then we left, I think this was it. I don't remember if it was, maybe this was a different one. Uh, It might've been 33 Variations. I think that we might've brought someone to that one too. But but at the end, you're just talking about, you're talking about life, right? And you're talking about people and you're talking about God and it's amazing, right? And I love that. Well, really good art makes you do that. It makes you ask questions, whether it's paintings or books or, you know, any, I mean, I guess books, literature, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like a movie or, or any sort of art form makes you ask questions and have a conversation and, and yeah, and talk about life. And if you are able to do that and open up the dialogue with people that don't believe what you believe, that's such an important Mm -hmm. thing to be able to do, you know, and you wouldn't, and and that's not to say, again, there's stuff that I, as a person, Sayla, don't feel comfortable doing, especially now as a mom of two boys, like with the internet. I don't want them to Google me and find me naked. You know what I mean? Like, when they're on the playground and some kid's like, I just Googled your mom, you know? So yeah. there's definitely things that I just can't do anymore as a human being. But but like, do I, I, there, I mean, I used to really be judgmental towards characters and just wouldn't play them, you know? Yeah. So that's crazy now when I look back. <laughs> like, yeah. Wow. yeah. Well, you know, you getting married, having children, how do you think that that's sort of readjusted your love of acting? Yeah, that's a hard, it's, it's really hard because I can't do it as much as I would love. I wish I had 48 hours a day, you know, but you just can't, you can't do it. And unless you are, you know, a movie star and can afford three nannies or whatever, or even not even a movie star, but just like working consistently. Mm -hmm. I think it's really hard to do both. There's roles that I've gotten recently that my agents will send me and I'm just like, I don't have time to do this. Like, Mm -hmm. it's not, it's not going to change my life. Yeah. Yeah. If I got it, it's not important enough. It's another, you know, whatever role I've already played. And so, and in the money's okay or whatever. So I'm like, I just, I don't have time. I have a newborn. This might all change in a year. I'll be able to get back to maybe doing some of those types of roles. But, you know, it's like, you have to be a little pickier. I definitely can't do theater for a while mm-hmm. while the kids are so little when they're in school, maybe. But if I do a show, it has to be something so special that I'm like dying to do and I'll never get another chance. You know, because that's not telling them good night for at three months, you yeah. know? So. Yeah. Which I, I feel like isn't necessarily a bad thing, 
right? Like I was on a I was on a call with an actress that might get attached to a project, right? And yeah. you know, she had a child and she was like, you know, if I'm attaching to this, why? <laughs> like like yeah. why why are you, why am I going to give up all of those things? Is that story yeah, right. important enough to us as the, you know, yeah. ones writing or directing it? Um, I feel like that's maybe a standard that <laughs> we should have more often. No, totally. I, I'm really glad actually it's made me less, it's made me much more selective and choosy and, and not just saying yes to do something that I'm not excited about, you know, which I've done a million of those. Uh -huh. Why do I need to do that anymore? You know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. It makes you more. Yeah. Um, my kids obviously know you as Chloe. Right? Um, so they're always, like, they're always like, Daddy knows Chloe. And I'm like, yes, that yes, is, I do. Have I done a message for them? You have Did not, you? but their birthdays oh are com their birthdays are coming up. So I will definitely hit Don't you up. Don't let me forget. For their birthdays. I do that for yeah, all January my friends. January and February. It is coming okay. up and they're going to love it. Do not let me forget. Um, you know, I do. So I'm on Cameo now. Uh -huh. Do you know Cameo? Yeah. It's like the, the like you can get people to like do specialized. Yeah breeding yeah. so but oh. how did you get into voice acting and what has that been like for you recently okay so voice acting is really interesting when i was at uc irvine i taught voice at this studio this music school mm -hmm. i had like 500 jobs in college like i did everything uh -huh. <laughs> so that was one of my jobs i taught singing at this music school and one of my students was the sound engineer for this studio down in tustin and he's like, you know, we're doing a bunch of anime. You should be one of the voices. I'm like, okay, I don't know what that is. I don't know what you're talking about, but mm -hmm. sure. I said yes to anything that paid, right? I'm like, I need money. So we, so he had me down. I didn't even have to audition. Like I just was hired. It was crazy. And I learned on the spot dubbing anime. Uh, wow. And yeah, it was crazy because uh -huh. dubbing is the hardest voiceover. I don't care what anyone says. Like you're trying to match what, what's hard about yeah. it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You're trying to match the flap, like we call it, you know, mm -hmm. the mouth moving. And Japanese, for one thing, is really hard because their syllables are totally different. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to, like, get it exactly right so it doesn't look terrible. And at the same time, so you're reading the band goes across like this. And you're looking at the mouth of the cartoon. So you're reading at the same time. And there's no rehearsal. So you have to act in the moment and just decide what to do. Uh -huh. And usually you get a couple takes maybe, but you also want to move fast because the faster you go, the sooner you're out and you get paid the same, you know, it's like, uh -huh. <laughs> so you don't want to do a million takes. Um, and then there's all the efforts, which is like when they're, I mean, you have to do that in regular voiceover too, but like if they're jumping or if they're getting uh -huh. in a fight in anime, there's a ton of that, you know? Uh -huh. So it was like, ah, ah. Oh, you know, yeah. all these things. It's exhausting. But so I so I did like three different series for him. I was a series regular on three different shows. These are all like non-union, you know. Mm -hmm. And then um, they hired me through that to be the voice of Thumbelina at the San Diego Zoo. Mm. Really cool. And then I did, I think I did a couple commercials. Anyway, I did a bunch of stuff. Then I moved to LA and I had all this experience. So I put together a reel and I got signed with the top voiceover agency, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was this big, big voiceover agency. And right away booked some commercials. And then within like a few months, nothing. It just wow. like, I kept auditioning, but I kept not booking. And I'm like, what is going on? And finally they dropped me and they were like, we need to focus on our celebrity clients. This was like many years ago too, I'm not giving away my age so much today. But um, <laughs> but they were at the time uh, focusing on their voiceover or their celebrity clientele. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to give up on voiceover. Because it, it's the thing with voiceover is it's very, very time consuming. Like you have to, well, back then before home studios were as popular as they are now. Um, you would go into your agent's office, you would do your auditions like every day. And it sounds glamorous, like all these auditions, but it's very, when you're trying to work day jobs and trying to work your schedule, it's a lot. And to not be booking, it's really hard. So mm. I was like, this isn't worth it. I can't do this anymore. So I kind of quit and I was sad about it because I loved voiceover. I was good at it too. And so then I had this reel though, and one of my friends flash forward like a year was working on this show called The Jungle Bunch. And it was, I don't even, it was like this 
network. I don't even remember what it was on, but then they made a movie with Universal. Anyway, I gave her my reel and I said, hey, I do voiceover and I told her everything I'd done. And she gave it to the director, who was Ezra Weiss, who directs Miraculous. So you see where this is going. Mm, yes. I auditioned for Jungle Bunch. I got hired. And then Ezra called me in a year later to audition for Miraculous. And I got it. And the miraculous thing about Miraculous was that it was just a pilot. Nobody thought anything of it. And we were dubbing it from French. Mm -hmm. And, oh, Jungle Bunch was dubbing also. So that's why... I, I mean, I, by then I was very good at dubbing. <laughs> so, but anyway, so we did Miraculous, the pilot, and I didn't even think twice about it. I'd, I had done another one for him too. So it was like one of those things where you're like, it's not going to go anywhere or whatever. And then boom, it just exploded. And yeah. overnight we were like famous, <laughs> like not famous, but in the voiceover world, like it yeah. was like a huge hit. And now we originated the movie for like we didn't even dub it we originated really yeah but the so episodes are still dubbed correct the episodes are still dubbed mostly there are some we get where the artwork's not even finished wow and we're like trying to do oh shoot my husband just texted i think micah is hungry <laughs> that's okay, the newborn we'll wrap up um, well, yes anyway so that it exploded and uh that was that and that is how i got my next agent with wme two years ago um, I finally was like, after like two years of being on the show, I'm like, I should probably get an agent again. <laughs> so I got an agent with WME and then I booked a couple things with them. And then sadly during COVID, they dropped every voiceover client that is not a celebrity. Really? Yeah. When you would think that right now is like the prime time. I, and everyone has a home booth now and yeah. like all this but stuff. It, but that might be part of it too, because people don't need agents to cast voice voice talent anymore <laughs> that's true well yeah. maybe i don't know i think sadly like a lot of our industry celebrities or more well-known people i should say are doing role less things they wouldn't do in the past right. you know whether it's yeah. a commercial or a smaller role on a cartoon or a animated movie in the past a celebrity would never do that you know right. but now Everyone wants to work. Uh, <laughs> like, it's true. It's true. Everyone's well, I will it. say that you do a fantastic. I didn't. I I knew that it was French, but I didn't know that it was dubbed. And and it's funny because I. Oh wow. I was talking with another parent friend of mine, uh, and because their kids watch Miraculous too. And then when I <gasps> said, "Oh, it's French," and she was like, "Really? <laughs> right? Like yeah. but it looks so like the voices match like so Thank perfectly. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell Ezra that. That's a real and Mike, our engineer. That's a real compliment yeah, to them. Yeah, like they had no idea. I was like, it's in Paris, and they were like, Yeah, we don't like Americans could just set it in Paris. We don't know. That's true. That's true. I, yeah. do know. I yeah. know. And no, it's, it's and, and hey, the best critic, my children. For some reason, they keep coming back to Miraculous. <laughs> like it's weird because other other shows, you know, will come and go, and then. Right now, my daughter's been drawing like miraculous stuff like crazy. So it is a good show. It is a good show. And I watch it with them. Everyone loves it. I use it for <laughs> whenever we, uh, whenever my oldest daughter's having a tantrum, I'm like, are you being akumatized right now? And she's like, yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> so, That's yeah. hilarious. Very useful. It's a really, people love it. I mean, it's good. I love it too, obviously. But it's yeah. it's funny how you're right. People are really loyal. Our fan base is super loyal. Like, yeah. they're awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, last question then before you go is um, just what's giving you artistic life then right now in the midst of quarantine and yes. newborn you know where are you finding kind of your artistic fountain that's a good question well so i am still recording miraculous which is awesome and i love doing that i really i love my job with that um so that's great and then i don't know if you saw any of my quarantine sketches mm -hmm. that i put up so i was doing some comedy stuff i was yeah. doing stand-up too I, I yes I, I saw I saw the clips that you posted and it was great. Yay, thank you. It's my mom com mom comedy. <laughs> hey, <laughs> and then all of my favorite comics are like dad comics or mom oh, comics. Yeah. It's like that's where we're at in our lives. Yeah. We gotta find the humor, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I am producing a movie, actually. So we're trying to get that off, COVID safe and everything. 
And then I'm on the production committee for the co-op. So even though I can't really go on stage anytime soon, it's nice. Well, nobody can, <laughs> mm-hmm. but it's nice to, I sort of had a baby at the perfect time, by the way, because like nothing's going on. <laughs> it's really the, I didn't even plan it, but it, it was great that it happened that way. But yeah, so those things. Well, I know. Well, Selah, thank you so much for thank spending you, time Jesus. tonight with me. And yeah, I appreciate you as a friend and hope thank to be able to work with you, you much more in the future. Likewise. Thank you. I loved working with you, Omega Man. I think that'll always be special to me because I was actually pregnant and I didn't know it. I know. So that was awesome. All right. So, Thanks. Thank you.